Good morning from Hong Kong, audience from different time zone. Welcome back to the VPAT International Conference 2020. You know, Karina, gaining real life work experience and industry recognized credentials are important for VPAT, right? Right. Now we are all ears for the plenary session Applied Education and Future Skills in the Digital Era. You can take part in the discussion by posting questions, sharing your point of view, or joining the polling using the comment box on your screen. Don't miss the chance. The convener of this plenary session is Professor Christina Hong, President of the Technological and Higher Education Institute of Hong Kong, Vocational Training Council. We'd like to invite the following panel members to join the discussion. Professor Dr. Philip Gunnan, Director of the Institute of Education, University of Zurich, Switzerland. Dr. Sean Gallagher, Director of Center for the New Workforce, Swinburne University of Technology, Australia. Mr. Andrew Chong, Chairman of Institute of Technical Education, Singapore. Please welcome Professor Hong and the panelists. Good morning all, and a very special warm welcome to our VPET friends and colleagues from around the world. I understand there are over 5,000 registered attendees uh, to this e-conference, so it's wonderful to have you share this day with us. Uh, a special welcome also to my panelists from Australia, Singapore and Switzerland, who will each share perspectives on the subject of applied education and future skills in the digital era. VPET as we know it here in Hong Kong, has always played a vital role in nurturing the development of a skilled workforce. We meet the needs of industry and we enable economic development. And as we heard in the keynote earlier, skills are the only way of competing. VPET in the 21st century integrates real life work experiences and mentoring with campus-based education and training for our students that aligns with the concept of applied education. A distinguishing feature of applied education is its emphasis on partnership with industry, working in tandem to ensure relevant and responsive shifts to meet the ever-changing environment in the digital era. Reforms in education systems and new ways of thinking about what constitutes 21st century workforce skills are being undertaken as countries address the need to adopt and adapt to new and often disruptive technologies in the workplace. So let's begin then by asking our panelists to provide their perspectives and sharing of applied education case developments in their respective countries. First, Let's cross to Sean Gallagher, who is the Director of Centre for New Workforce at the Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, Australia. Sean, your centre is a new research initiative at Swinburne with a focus on the digital, e digital economy that aims to realise our peak human potential. How should VPET be creating learning and value for workforce futures? Over to you, Sean. Great. Thank you very much, Christina. Let me just move to sharing my screen. One second. Here we go. Hopefully that's there. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm really pleased to be with you virtually in Hong Kong. I'm very sad that I can't be there in Hong Kong. It's one of my favorite cities on the planet, but I'm certainly hoping that you're having a successful and enjoyable day so far. So what are the most important skills for the future of work? Well, as I'm sure you probably have heard from many people saying, we need to increasingly focus on our human skills. But it's not just that. And it's more about having a combinatorial skill set. Many organizations talk about having both the human and the technical skills. But I think the World Economic Forum does it pretty well. You know, to be truly successful in new roles, workers need unique combinatorial skill set. So that's at the intersection of human skills on one side and functional skills and expertise on the other side. And leaders, and that's you, 
you need to underpin all of the skill building efforts that we do in training all of our students with you know the important parts of values like curiosity openness to growth dealing with amb ambiguity which is so important right now in these strange times this is the best way to prepare our students for that future of work in australia i wanted to understand what that combination look like for workers uh the average australian worker and so we did some research to find out what does the average australian worker how do they value expertise so those functional and digital skills so the skills needed to do tasks versus on the other side social competencies some people call them soft skills but certainly you know emotional skills collaborative social skills but also entrepreneurial decision making risk taking etc those skills those needed to work with people and understand humans well later in the panel we're going to go through and show you the results of what the average australian worker thinks but right now i'll invite you to go to your slido and to take the first poll I want you to tell me what you think is the most important in that combinatorial skill set what the most important skill is for the future of work is it the skills required to do tasks or the skills required to do work with people or is it potentially both it is not just what skills our students learn but it's also how they learn them and to explain a little bit about that i want to start with the why most work in most organizations today is routine and predictable tasks and if it's routine and predictable that means it can be codified and if it can be codified it can be written as an algorithm and that means it's vulnerable to being disrupted and displaced by ai for instance here in hong kong in the next 5 years fathom which is a future of work software as a service company based in sydney but does global work they predict 26% of jobs in hong kong are going to be impacted by ai over the next 5 years 15% are going to be automated whereas 11% are going to be augmented augmented means that for the worker to continue working in that job they need to be significantly upskilled in order to work with these new technologies but that's quite an astonishing figure one in four jobs in hong kong are going to be impacted by ai over the next 5 years i think we need and so basically uh, what's happening is that these technologies are competing with the you know with the type of skills that many of our students are graduating with so i think that we need to change the way that we focus on learning and prepare students for higher value work and the context is critical so you know one of the things i say is work is where digital disruption is occurring not the classroom so how do we take learning increasingly out of the classroom and put it in the place where the disruption is occurring we call this learning integrated work and there are three levels to this type of learning of course it's the best way to describe it is like learning a foreign language you know the best way to learn the foreign language is to immerse yourself in that foreign environment and and likewise to know whether you have become an expert in that foreign language it's not whether you can conjugate verbs it's whether you can work whether you can have relationships whether you can do meaningful things using the foreign language in that foreign culture and that's exactly what learning for the future of work is like so there are three levels to the learning for the future of work level 1 is as we know we need knowledge and expertise that is absolutely essential to perform tasks in existing work that's fundamental we still need to know how to do things and to be expert and stuff but that is no longer going to be our competitive advantage in the future because that's exactly the kind of work that digital technologies is disrupting increasingly we need to focus on level 2 learn which is how do we collaborate with our colleagues to focus on really complex problems that only humans can figure out to to work together to actually come up with a solution but ultimately 
the highest level is level three learning. And that is about creating new knowledge, creating new value by looking over the horizon and solving unforeseen challenges and emergent opportunities. That is where I think we need to work as humans because that's not what technology can do. So I, I look forward to talking a little bit more about this later in the panel. Thanks, Christina. So let's remind viewers of the first polling question that Sean has just um, spoken about. So please do provide your responses and we will be reviewing shortly. So it is a question around the combinatorial skill sets um, that Sean was um, mentioning. So how do you value uh, you know, skills, tasks, um, in comparison with those social competencies? And you have three options there. So, so get your phones and devices out and, and really please uh, give your vote. So Sean, you talked about learning integrated work. Now I know that we have a lot of curriculum developers and educators uh, in our viewing audience. And I'm sure they'd be interested to know how do we make that work? How do you actually integrate that into your curriculum, into your programs, and, and into the learning journey of our learners? Thanks, Christina. Let me just pull the relevant slide once more. Uh, here we go. So at Swinburne University, we have developed a higher apprenticeship program. It's focused on industry for, and you know, one of the competitive advantages of all vocational professional education and training is that we have very strong relationships with industry. So this is about leveraging those existing relationships. And as I mentioned before, industry is where the disruption is occurring. So increasingly it's having those partnerships to ensure that the learning of the student is actually in tune with how uh, digital disruption is occurring we change the purpose of the learning. And it's about how the students, the higher apprentices are working side by side with industry and they're creating new values. So that level three learning by co-creating new technologies and work practices. The graduates are acting as change agents. I wanna give you an example of one and then I'll come back in terms of how you integrate it in terms of the curriculum. So Dulux is a paint company, as I'm sure you all know, and they work closely with the tech company Siemens. Well, on the outskirts of Melbourne, Dulux has Australia's first Industry 4.0 factory. And one of the things about Industry 4.0 is that every time you do a, a new product for a customer, it's bespoke. So every batch of paint is absolutely bespoke for that customer. So you can imagine a lot of cleaning of the vats needs to occur. Let me just quickly explain the cleaning process. So you can see those two lances, uh, they descend into the vat, they eject a very uh, high pressure spray of water, and then those scrapers turn around and they clean the inside of the vat. But what was happening is that the lances weren't pulling up before the scrapers were turning around and they kept breaking, costing tens of thousands of dollars in repair work, as well as a lot of in terms of the production process. So the company gave that problem to the students to solve, the higher apprentices. Now they thought, the company, thought it was a PLC issue. Well, the students went in and they discovered it's not a PLC issue at all. They went back to the company and they proposed a different way to solve this problem. They created a, a 3D model that you can see there, but they also created its digital twin. So they were using their technical expertise, creating something that replicated what was happening in real life. Imported the real life data and then quickly figured out what exactly was going wrong. There was a change in the viscosity of the paint that of course the PLC was never gonna pick up. So the students created value for Dulux by bringing together, you know, by focusing on an unforeseen challenge that weren't, didn't realize, taking the advanced technical expertise, their mastery of the, the tools of those technologies and combining it with their uniquely human skills. So talking to the company and creating, you know, uh, telling them as to why they needed to have a different approach and they solve that problem. So of course, not every program at every institution can look like this, but flagship programs are really important because from that you get case studies 
And those case studies can inform, and which is what we're doing at Swinburne, they're informing the curriculum right across the place, you know, well beyond, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, media and film industry, for example. What does industry 4.0 mean for that? So in particular, problem solving, the importance of being masters of technology, social competencies, and of course, creating a culture of curiosity and risk-taking in all of our programs is essential. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, Sean. That's a fascinating example, actually, of value creation uh, in terms of VPET and its contribution back to the industry and to communities at large. So I, I love that notion of problematizing and uh, learners as change agents. So I'm sure we'll talk more about that as the uh, session goes on. So I'd allow, like to cross to Andrew. So Andrew Chong is the chairman of the Institute of Technical Education. And Andrew's going to share with us what's happening in applied education and e-education culture in uh, Singapore. Uh, over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Christina, and good morning, everyone. So we, indeed, um, <coughs> There's been uh, some key shifts in the thinking of education in Singapore over the last few years. A return to the future for applied learning, if you'd like to think of it, about it that way, where we combined interdisciplinary uh, classroom knowledge with a very heavy dose of um, applied uh, work-based application of those skills. As automation replaces a lot of the repetitive tasks, human education needs to now refocus on those area where there is a competitive uh, advantage. This means a focus on interdisciplinary skills, requiring the context in which those skills are important. And then you apply all of this into specific applications. And of course, the additional issue is that it will change over time. So therefore, the skills and the applications in which they sit will have to be renewed constantly, lifelong learning. Some of this is, of course, very much driven um, by industry itself having uh, to adapt to the changing, highly competitive environment. In ITE, we handle this with uh, a characteristic of applied learning, where there is strong industry engagement and a learner-centric experience. Let me share an example of this. An example is our work-study diploma, where there is a co-creation of work-based curriculum with industry. This is to ensure relevant skills, relevant learning in a useful environment. Additionally, assessments are done in the workplace to give credit to that mastery. So you reinforce what you believe is really important. To do this, lecturers have to work very, very closely with company supervisors on the work-study program, complementing the activities in the classroom as well as the one in the workplace. Besides the advantages for the students, of course, ITE's work-study program gives company the chance to re-engineer their work process with the concurrent retraining of their workers in order to be able to enable the implementation of those changes. So uh, a very good example of this is obviously the digitalization of the workplace. Similarly to what Sean mentioned, the students themselves can now be change agents for the industry. Soft skills, so social skills, as Sean mentioned, um, become increasingly uh, important. Why? This is an essential element of the human competitive advantage. And it is included, has to be included, in the design of the curriculum and has and is reinforced in the applied learning in the real life situation. An example of this is the collaboration skills needed not only to solve complex problems, but actually to decide how to approach a problem and in fact to prioritize and define what is the most uh, critical problem to address at that time. The continued renewal of skills to match those industry needs um, is critical. But if you look at many of our young workers uh, nowadays, they are also interested in exploring different individual careers. So lifelong learning is a key enabler to allow both of this. It is also a very important part of building a resilient workforce for a stable economy and for resilient careers for individuals. The accelerating changes we are likely to see coming out of the COVID-19 crisis will certainly 
challenge the status quo of the economic and social models. One such change is clearly the need for increasing digital skills in education and for education. For education, the recent experience has shown the need to be able to learn anytime, anywhere, on any device. This is also a vital enabler for lifelong learning because the accessibility, the flexible accessibility of that education and the ability to collaborate remotely becomes more and more important. In education, combining tech savviness with analytical, collaborative and ethical skills is one of the paths to bringing technology into the workplace to create competitive advantage in the industry. It's this collaboration between useful skills and the useful application of those skills that will create meaningful jobs for the economy. So an example of this is not only the skill to solve problems, but to define the right ones. And especially the use of technologies uh, on one of the examples here are the drones is that there is also the issue of ethics. How and when do you use technology? And these are soft skills, social skills decisions that humans must continue to make. The delivery of such collaborative lifelong education will certainly demand innovative approaches and IT in Singapore is continually renewing its methodologies and curriculum in order to prepare our students for future skills and future jobs. Christina. Thank you, Andrew. So, Andrew, you also have many decades of experience in the technology sector uh, within the Asia Pacific region, and you sit on, a, on various national committees related to workforce, employment, and employability in Singapore. So with all that you have just mentioned, you, you did uh, talk about industry, but I'm sure we'd be more interested uh, in, in drilling down just a little around uh, your industry connections. So how does industry uh, think uh, about uh, VPET and how it can integrate more with industry uh, with a view to addressing the digital issues? Indeed, it's a, obviously a curiosity why a person like me, I'm, I'm an industrialist, I'm not an educationalist, uh, would have an interest in the area of uh, education. But, and, and, and that's clearly because there are actually two issues to be solved um, uh, when you come to look at education. One are the gaps in industry itself, the people who create the requirements ultimately, and of course, then uh, the concurrent gaps that need to be uh, addressed in education uh, to address industry needs. Uh, the capability of industry to transform itself is uneven, um, as you can imagine, uh, between countries and also uh, between different companies. And so it is rather important that um, VPET education plays a role of bridging uh, between industry requirements and the skills that are available. So in effect, we have to encourage companies to examine their mid and long term needs uh, tomorrow's problems, not only today's labor shortage or today's cash flow issues. So collaboration may have to go beyond the companies themselves to industry trade associations, uh, uh, economic agencies, consultants, and of course the institutes of higher learning. This collaboration will allow the creation of meaningful problems to be solved for industry. And when they are solved by the delivery of the right forms of education and skills, um, then we create meaningful jobs for our workers and competitive advantage for our industries. Christina. Thanks, Andrew. I'm sure those around the world, we couldn't agree more. The, the integration and the cooperation, collaboration um, across industries, professions to actually achieve those outcomes. So thank you very much. All right, it's time to have a look at that first polling question. So if you have not yet hit your button, uh, and, and selected your option, please do so now. Uh, and on screen, we will see then the, the results. So it looks very much like option C. Uh, equally important, expertise and social competencies. So Sean, you started all this. So uh, I'm going to cross to you for, for comments. Great, thank you very much. Now think about who you are, but also think about in, in terms of your, your age and your generation, but also think about what, what, what industries you're preparing your students for. And 
that will help you understand the mindset of a lot of the industries that we're preparing our workers to, to go into. So let me just quickly show you um, how this compares generationally. So you can see that in Australia, if you're a baby boomer, so, you know, of 45, 50 and older, um, you have a very traditional view of work. You value the skills needed to do tasks at two, almost three times more important as the skills needed to work with and understand people. So older generation people have very mechanistic view of work. You have a skill, you can do a task, there's a unit of output. But the younger generation workers recognize that work is far more complex. Skills are important, but we need to continue to work with humans. Now, let's take a look at the various sectors of the Australian economy. There are three non-government sectors. The asset sector, which is construction, mining, utilities, service sector, retail, health, education, transport, and the knowledge sector, professional services, banking, finance, etc. They have different levels of digitization. So the lowest digitized, so the least disrupted is the asset sector, and the most disrupted is the knowledge sector. Workers in the asset sector have a very traditional view of work. Again, the skills, those functional skills, those technical skills are far more important, according to workers in those industries, than it is to work with people. Whereas in the knowledge sector, it's almost equal. So in other words, workers in the knowledge sector have a mindset that actually is very similar to that combinatorial skill set. So valuing both. And, but you can also see a timeline here that what is happening to the knowledge sector will soon happen to workers in the service sector and, of course, workers in the asset sector. So think about when you're preparing students to go into these various industries, that the mindset of the people that they're going to be working for is probably going to be quite different to how we're thinking about preparing them. Thank you, Christina. Thanks, Sean. Very interesting considerations, actually. Um, and now, let's move over to Switzerland, where really the dawn is only just breaking, is it not, Philip? So good morning to you. So thank you very much for uh, getting up rather early in the morning to share with us. So Philip, you're at the University of Zurich, um, and we look forward to hearing from you about applied education in Switzerland and your local case studies. So over to you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you uh, to everybody who has invited me. Let me now share the screen. Um, do you see the screen now? Yes, thank you. No? Okay, good. So we start with a more general analysis. Uh, I would say that work and education are two sectors who are nowadays heating up a bit. So uh, my focus will be what happens with the education and what with VPET. And I would say it's a heating up a bit, uh, remembering to a espresso, which is coming slowly, slowly, but then at the end you will have a, a very a sophisticated uh, product. And I would say the Swiss VPET system is a bit like a Swiss watch today. Uh, it is a system uh, on a formal level, which is very much uh, sophisticated in quite different um, elements on the secondary and on the higher level, uh, on a more professional level or on a more uh, academic level. And these elements are very much permeable it is possible to start uh, with an apprenticeship, for example, and then uh, get in the tertiary uh, level of education. So the system is quite permeable and very differentiated. And so it is possible for the students to, and for the apprentices to have a flexible career planning and a flexible uh, study program. So the starting point uh, of our uh, talk, uh, of my talk today, is the digitalization and uh, the impact of digitalization uh, regarding uh, the vocational VPET system. Digitalization can be studied on different levels. And what I do is starting with some uh, empirical uh, research with some projects I have done, or, or you can also uh, have a look to. 
Uh, and my concept is that there is a gradual uh, reform or a gradual transformation of apprenticeships or of VPET all in all. So we can say the new devices like iPhone and tablets and so on do not exist such a long time. It's more or less since uh, the um, 2006 iPhone was introduced, tablets uh, later, and this has changed very much, uh, not also, not only the workplace, but also our everyday uh, living and also work. So in schools, for example, uh, the apprenticeships and in, in the workplace uh, getting more flexible. Uh, so we have in Switzerland uh, seen how much the informatics as a curriculum and uh, um, an apprenticeship has changed a lot the same is happening in industry, workplace learning. Uh, so connectivity is a very uh, high issue. Uh, how to uh, connect different persons, different uh, work processes. And uh, this is also very in, uh, important. Also in uh, VPET uh, school uh, settings, uh, new forms are uh, getting more important, like for example, class uh, unlimited, and uh, flipping classrooms and so on. Uh, a specific topic was what I was looking for was uh, the, um, the tablet as an instrument of learning, tablets for learning in schools, but tablets also for uh, as a tool in the workplace. It's the same uh, device which uh, students and apprentices uh, bring in in the, uh, in the school, but also in the workplace. Our observations in such learning sites show that the instrument of learning uh, is used quite uh, a bit and um, yeah, in different settings. And the apprentices and students are not just enthusiastic about these instruments, about these devices, but there is more or less something like a pro and contrast, pros and cons. So the handiness of the instrument of the tablet is a uh, pro uh, folders and orders of subjects, mo mobile learning. There is no paper on the one side and internet and research uh, possibilities on the contra is the lack of efficiency uh, mentioned working with text and procedures, which is not so easy as with paper. That's why some people see paper learning as a better form of learning. Uh, technical volatility and uh, the lack uh, sometimes of transparency or of clarity for users. That were, were some of the um, results we found out when observing and when talking with apprentices. So you know, at a first glance, we see that there is uh, some kind of a bottom-up practice uh, in several places. Uh, digitalization is visible, but uh, in my view, not as much as expected. Tablets uh, are, are justified as instrument, uh, but uh, there is more or less the um, attitude that digital digitalization is more a uh, complementary element to the existing practice in school and workplace. What happens and what I could say is that there is some kind of hybrid, hybridization that different forms of learning are coming together and uh, the limits uh, of different um, elements are uh, in a way blurred or could be more or less combined. Uh, what I'm showing you now is a table which is uh, named dispositive of a transformation which is in VPET, I think, a very um, useful view to look at it in such a way that uh, is less looking at um, structures and elements, but much more as, as figures, figures of workers, figures of learners. And you can say that a craftsperson, that is the traditional uh, kind of uh, VPET, uh, the traditional craftsman uh, who is uh, in, he, he is working in a small um, workshop. In, uh, he, is, he was organized in a trade guild and he is uh, very much uh, also included in a uh, home 
and daily task work. And this kind of craftsperson was more or less uh, transformed in a skilled uh, person, in a professional person uh, who is more um, doing practice. He is more a professional or she's more a professional. And this is also in including formal uh, instruction and, and school-based work, not just as in the craftsman uh, period where the workers were just imitating and uh, doing informal work and also informal learning. Nowadays, we are more in a globalized world and in a globalized world, uh, there are other um, elements important like network, like also more a competence-based approach, more or less self-directed learning and things which were already mentioned, creativity. Um, I have also transformed this, um, this table in a learning uh, setting and uh, showing these uh, learning settings will be um, the, one of my last slides. You can see that uh, in the craftsmanship era, more the imitation was the important element. Apprenticeship is much, uh, much um, shown by apprenticeship, which is uh, apprentice, which is supervised by a master. And the learner's role is an active role and uh, the teaching is very personal and it is informal, as I already said. This is the typical workplace learning. Then uh, the professionalism is more or less uh, including the instruction, which means that the learner is more in a passive role and the instructor is more a lecturer or one who presents knowledge. And this is more a formal uh, way of learning. And the typical uh, institutional setting is the educational institution. Nowadays, more with the uh, entrepreneurial or explorative uh, approach uh, in the global times, it is more that the learner is again an active and explorer uh, and is uh, the master or instructor is more or less in the background. So self-activity and discovering is very important. And this uh, form of learning includes informal and formal learning. So uh, the specific environment is not as clear as in formal periods. It's more the specific environment in schools and in companies. So let me... Um, make some kind of a conclusion. The task today is to find balance on an adequate mixture of different modes of learning and combining the advantages of several places of learning like school and the workplace. And this is uh, even enforced by the perspective of digitalization. The changes and prospects are more gradual than disruptive and are oriented toward the sustainment of trusted concepts. That is, traditional schooling and workplace instruction are still important. Meanwhile, the expectation for learners to muddle through and to find their individual uh, way in a digital environment has been increased. Technology is not an imperative, but more an incentive to modify established ways of teaching and learning. Yes, these are more or less my uh, conclusions and uh, I would now uh, give uh, the, I, I would now um, end my presentation Thanks very much, and thank you Christina. Thank you very much. So I think your, your case study around the digital device, of course, is highly topical right now. And uh, we'll, we'll move to that shortly. But in fact, let's uh, keep our viewers busy and uh, put up the second polling question. Now, the second polling question really relates to what uh, important factors do you believe will enable VPET to really uh, be understood, uh, be, be acknowledged? We heard this morning um, our keynote uh, saying that oftentimes VPET is, is not the immediate preferred choice. 
uh, and we need to do some things. So I would be interested in finding out, and you have four options there, of what you, our viewers, both here in the studio and also um, internationally, consider would be the most important enabling factor. Now, while you're doing that, we're going to engage the uh, panel um, on a couple of questions. Now, firstly, uh, I'm interested, and maybe I'm going to go to Andrew first, from an industry point of view, COVID has made us change uh, dramatically the way in which we work, uh, sorry, work and learn and, in fact, socialise. From an industry perspective, once this all dies down, and, and hopefully it is soon, um, how do you think industry, the world of work, is going to change? So one of the um, key learnings from the COVID situation for industry is to, to relook at that balance between resilience and cost. Uh, cost has always been, and uh, we've had 10 very, very good years of high economic growth, and industry does what industry does best, and it starts to look for efficiency, and it, it's very, very good at doing so. With the big disruption of COVID, um, uh, what industry, a lot of industry, and um, uh, together with government are really looking at is actually the resilience of the systems. And within that resilience is therefore uh, topics of supply chain, uh, topics of uh, labor, uh, uh, topics of health. So put all this together, there will be in the long run um, quite a major change in the way uh, industry uh, places requirements uh, onto the ecosystem. So I think, of course, education will have to um, uh, adapt to this as well. Just look at the issue uh, of uh, collaboration. Um, perhaps uh, uh, internships uh, can be a combination of both physical but also uh, uh, online uh, collaboration. Um, the, uh, uh, the type of skills that industry would expect coming uh, from uh, its workers uh, would be much, much more digital, um, and there will be an acceleration of uh, automation. So I think many of the trends have already been in place. It's now a matter of shifting of priorities um, in the competitive marketplace. Christina. Thanks, Andrew. Now, I'm just aware that, that time is ticking down, so I'm going to, to ask for a very quick response from um, Sean first and then over to Philip around those enablers. So, so how do we better position VPET um, for the digital future and for workforce futures? Sean? I think this, um, let me put it uh, very quickly, in, succinctly into three. And this is also, I think at the same time, it combats the, uh, the threat of automation of many of the occupations that our graduates are gonna go into. First of all, I think it has to do with technology. We need to prepare workers who are masters of technology, not just responding to it and using it, but are actually controlling and manipulating it. The second is those folk that focus on social competencies, working together collaboratively, solving problems is critically important. And the third thing, which is, you know, the verb that I'm learning from our session uh, over this time is, is problematizing. That is what technology cannot do is find and frame problems. That's what humans are incredibly adept at doing. That's how we deal with digital technologies. Yes, we need digital skills, but that is just the entry level. We need to be able to become masters of technology, to work collaboratively and to find problems that haven't been solved before. Thanks, Sean. And very briefly, Philip, your views? Um, Yes, I think what is very important is that the education system and the uh, permeability between vocational and academic tracks is uh, going on and is deepening. And uh, this is very important to uh, uh, raise or educate uh, a workforce who is able to uh, to to meet the, the future digital transformation in the workplace. And I guess that uh, schools and universities and also workplace have to uh, have a common spirit in uh, valuing uh, these different uh, competences and values and uh, also accept that a change 
uh, is a very important issue uh, and which is which needs to have a, a common uh, also uh, a, a common um, workforce uh, who is uh, meeting these demands. So Thanks, Chris, Philip. Christina, I might say that, yes, um, sure. that I was actually talking to A. I think business and uh, needs to have a much closer association with uh, VPET. All right, so you're opting for A. Now let's see what our international audience and studio audience have uh, chosen. So let's review the answer to the second polling question. Aha. Oh, B. Uh, so 52% of you think that buy-in from stakeholders, including industry parents, students, uh, is, is really very important. So there we are, folks. You have spoken. Um, and, and that's the agenda for us all. Uh, now, we have some time for uh, uh, some quick questions from our studio audience. So, uh, and I know that we have uh, questions that have come in uh, from our virtual audience as well. So time, however, is, is, is a wee bit against us, but let's have our um, studio audience question. Okay, so over there, thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Ais, and I'm a student from Chaiwa Ivy campus. As you have mentioned about the applied learning, so I would like to know how can we prepare ourselves in this digital era? Thank you. All right, so who would like to take that? How do you prepare yourself for the digital era from a student point of view? I mean, I know that you have, there are various threads that have already come through the conversations. So how about um, a sentence from each of you? I'm really putting you on the spot now. So, Philip. Yes, how, I would, how do uh, students prepare themselves? Uh, thank you, Christina. I would say very important is, yes, to, uh, to follow the school programs and to be active in, uh, in work and in life. Uh, and this is very important, digitalization, preparing for this means that you should uh, keep on and uh, learning by doing and uh, talking with your colleagues. And this is a very important way how to learn. Okay, so some, some wise messages there from Philip. Okay, Andrew. There are two aspects uh, to the uh, technology. One is I think you need to be an expert in it. Um, this will form base, uh, a basic skill, uh, not only the usage, but the ability uh, to program, uh, et cetera. This will be like maths and, re and reading uh, in the future. And I think the deeper the expertise, um, uh, obviously the more options you will have. But secondly, as you go through the education on technology, think always about its application. That is the part where, again, humans have a particular advantage. How would you apply this? How would you modify it to apply it to a, a greater sense of problems? So that would be my advice. And Sean? I'm going to go to a very fundamental dimension of what it makes us to be human, and that's curiosity. Be curious about the world and things around you. When a, you hear a little voice in your head sort of question when you see something, listen to it and ask the question. It's by being curious that we're actually going to deal with increasing uncertainty and, and navigate these really strange times that we're in. And that way we'll know how to leverage our expertise in technology and you know, get the most out of our school system as both what uh, Andrew and Philip have talked about. Thank you for that. Now I'm going to, do, to look at the um, questions that have come on online. There is one there that says, uh, can we have more examples on how to personalize mass education? So I think another thread that's come through today has been that notion of moving from, you know, everybody doing the same thing to more personalization in your learning journeys. So how are you doing it, either in your own institutions, or how do you think it should be done? Um, let's take a stab. Philip? Oh, Sean, Sean, go ahead. Yeah, so my university has set up a, what's called a professional purpose program. And it's, it's come out of Stanford University, and we've adapted it for our purposes. But basically, the student develops. It's to help the student figure out who, what is their professional purpose. So they, you know, it's eventually going to be run by AI, but it will look at 
what their interests are, what they do, what their activities, so that the student actually begins to have a better understanding as to what drives them. And based on knowing that, they can then identify, oh, what pathway do I want to take in terms of my education? So that's the way we're approaching it. Thank you, Sean. Now, I understand that we have another um, studio question here, so maybe we'll go to the, the, the second um, studio question. Okay, your opportunity. Good morning, everyone. I'm Randy, a student from VTC. It's my pleasure to ask the professionals here. Um, so some said one could learn everything on YouTube nowadays. Uh, my question is, how would you recommend the uh, different educational institution to make good use of these online resources? Thank you. Okay, that is a very, very pertinent question. If we can access content online, do we need our bricks and mortars uh, institutions? So <laughs> it's a very, very compelling question for those of us that are gathered here. Um, so again, I'm, I'm going to throw that open to our uh, esteemed panellists to try and uh, provide an answer to that one. Do we need brick and, brick and mortar uh, institutions anymore? Okay, Sean is nodding. <laughs> Andrew, I can see that you've got a very new bricks and mortar um, uh, layout behind you, and I know that you are, in fact, building uh, a new campus, which looks stunning, by the way. So, Andrew. Well, if, if, if you look at the, um, I, I often think that it, it gets harder and harder uh, for our children and our children's children. There's more and more information that humanity has built up. And therefore, um, uh, you need to, just to get to base level it takes you longer than it did 100 years ago. So I think we need all the help that we can get. All the resources that are now in YouTube or everywhere else, it forms a fantastic uh, uh, enabler for efficiency. It allows uh, content to be delivered uh, on a pool basis uh, to the students based on their interests, um, based on their level of education. So I don't think that this is um, competitive. I think this is probably necessary. However, obviously, in order to make use of this, um, educational institutions will now have to incorporate this uh, within their program. I actually uh, watch my own children uh, do uh, their study at home now. And you see them going off on tangents. And that's what resources like this are very, very good for. It allows them to go off on a tangent. And should they reach a point where they want to develop it further, this is where, of course, education now has to uh, personalize the mass education. There must be then a, a way to bring back this curiosity, which Sean mentioned, these questions um, into a structured uh, educational process. So I see it as a tool. I see it as a necessary tool because there's much more in terms of uh, collaborative uh, working, in terms of problem definition skills that will have to be layered on top of our education system. Thanks, Andrew. Sean or Philip, any other comments? I'm happy to talk a, a little bit. Uh, I think there are many dimensions to this, okay. but let, let me give you two. One, I think uh, increasingly in all of the organizations we work with, it's going to be much less hierarchical and much more uh, agile ways of working, which means that every person in the organization needs to be a decision maker and finding themselves solving new problems. YouTube and other online content is going to help with just-in-time learning to, uh, you know, to solve a problem as the worker needs it in the flow of work. So they're incredibly valuable tools. At the same time, it also has a more profound implication. If all of our content can be delivered online, well, what's the purpose of a bricks and mortar institution? And I think that that asks us to reimagine why we have a campus. And so why would you come to campus just to sit in a lecture theater to download content that you could have done anywhere? I think we need to begin to reimagine that a campus should be a safe space to practice with the future of work. So bringing together other students and to work on complex problem solving in you know, highly digital environments, taking risks. You know, that's exactly what a campus should actually be about. So I think it's a great question and it's, it opens up many, many different uh, dimensions. 
Thank you. Philip, any last words from you? Yes, I would strongly support what has been said by my two other okay. colleagues. I also would say, uh, yeah, the bricks and water uh, place is very an important place where also social learning takes place, where uh, new concepts emerge, new ideas can uh, evolve. That is not so easy, just having a look in YouTube or in distance uh, learning programs. So the element of social sociality is very important for uh, learning. And uh, this uh, is better provided by being present as a personal uh, individual in a, a, a local setting and not just behind the screen. Thank you for those responses, um, Andrew, Sean and Philip. So I'm now going to, to draw this um, plenary panel session to a close. Uh, now, for me, and I hope for you, there are some key words and key understandings that have uh, become apparent as we have uh, had the conversation over the last hour or so. I think curiosity is vital to how we develop into the... We've talked about a number of aspects that really are about growth mindsets, uh, and that was mentioned this morning in one of the keynote sessions, that we need a combination of both industry and uh, skills, knowledge and understandings in combination with social and human interaction. And I think more and more as we move into the digital uh, and into AI, et cetera, that separation between is a space that we need to navigate so that we do, in fact, uh, talk about problematizing learning, engaging in those real-world problems with and for industry, and uh, moreover, learners as change agents, that together, in partnership with our learners, we can make a difference and uh, add value to our communities and industries. So um, this is the beginning of a conversation that I hope will continue. And I do invite, in fact, um, our viewers from around the world to the International Conference on Applied Education, Technology and Innovation. The I started that uh, international conference last year, and next year, when this all has settled a little, we do hope that we will be able to run yet another conference. But, as my con concluding remark, when I was doing my homework for this session, I came across uh, Sean's Centre for New Workforce website, and on it there was this quote, so I just want to listen to this. Simply adding digital skills to a traditional education is not enough to succeed in the digital economy. Learning has to be reimagined for the emerging futures of work. Learning has to be reimagined for the emerging futures of work. Now, as we are undergoing this condition that we're currently experiencing of COVID-19, Firstly, we have reacted, have we not, as a uh, education community and an ecosystem around the world. We react. We have very quickly had to bring our things online. Secondly, as we move through this, we are going to get into a resetting phase. We're going to question what we've done, how we can make things better, and what we need to do in the future as we shift. And then thirdly, is that notion of a phase of reinvention. It's what Sean is talking about when he says we need to reimagine. So I invite you to reinvent and to reimagine and to maybe next year coming back and sharing those stories with all of us here in Hong Kong. So thank you very much to my panel members, to Sean, to, uh, to Andrew and to Philip. Thank you to our viewers for your participation. Uh, stay well, stay healthy, stay curious. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hong and the speakers for such an informative discussion. Thank you for being with us this morning. And thank you for your wonderful questions, responses, or simply staying to watch our broadcast. That's the end of the morning program. After lunch, we'll continue our VPAT journey together, exploring workplace training and more related topics. Hey, Karina, do you know about the VTC Earn and Learn Scheme? Of course. Please stay tuned to find out how you can earn at the workplace and also learn in the classroom. For more exciting ideas and perceptive insight, enjoy your lunch. See you all again. See you.